that's uh, that's funny. So, um, no, w- w- one of the things I wanted to mention, I wanted to kind of explain for anybody who anybody who's listened to us for a while, they they probably heard Perry on before, but anybody who's coming here uh, new, wh- why I wanted to have both Kevin from Fangraphs and, and of baseball on here with uh, Perry. Uh, I'll get to that reason and point. I, I basically Perry and I became friends after we uh, both started. Well, I I started. Uh, I don't know, 2007, about 15 years ago. I don't know when you started, Perry. 2001. January 2001. 2nd, 2001 was my first. 2000. Yeah, 2001. We we were both employees at what was then called the All Media Guide. Uh, oh my god. Most yeah. famous for for all music. All music guide. Dot com. Sure. But Perry worked for allmovie.com, and I worked for allgame.com. Uh, and the music department was mostly kind of quiet and weird, and so was the games department. And then the movie department was kind of loud and weird. Uh, <laughs> Fair. Somewhere in this house, there's an all music guide. I was, I, yeah. behind, I was looking behind me, but somewhere in this house, there's a there's an all music guide. Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was a great place to work when I started there. It was 2007. It was all sorts of fun. Like it, it's kind of like what you would expect. There, it's a little bit like uh, the record store and High Fidelity. At, 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 um, and I was absolutely intimidated uh, when I started there because I didn't, you know, I'm not a big pop culture guy. At least I wasn't then. But I and I don't re- exactly remember how Perry and I became friends, but it happened naturally. Yeah, and, and I don't remember either. You were just, we were just hanging out right away. Is all I remember. Yeah. Um, and so we would, at, at, oftentimes at lunch, we would sit there and Perry would talk about movies and I would talk about baseball and and uh, we had fun doing that. And eventually we got to, I don't know, playing Stratomatic at lunch and things like that. And there was, a, in fact, a couple times where discussions that Perry and I had at lunch led to me writing into your old podcast, Kevin, uh, up, up and in to ask now a question. You're, now you're really aging yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is what, probably 2010, 2011? Yeah. I don't know, yeah that's sure. right. Um, and then Perry became uh, my co-host on a, a short-lived radio show called Bad Hop Radio that was 100% a ripoff of Up and In. <laughs> it, you know, I just, that was, I was the, my favorite podcast, so I wanted to do a show like it. The proper term is homage. Homage, yes. <laughs> uh, and I so it taught it, you that from all my film stuff over the years. Yes, Chris. it's true. You yes. know this word. Oh my, yes. Uh, but I, I, I just... The only other thing I wanted to mention was that, uh, you know, I, from listening to Chin Music, I'll occasionally hear when you do your uh, you know, moment of culture, Kevin, you, you mention something you watch in the Criterion channel. Yeah. And uh, Perry's the only other person I know who has the Criterion channel. So I thought, you know what? These two could talk about movies if we have to. Sounds like tough, it. It's a tough no. friend group. If that's, if you don't, if that's your only one. <laughs> well, I'm sure I have some other people, uh, friends who have it, but uh, yeah. Don't feel the need to talk about it 24-7. Yes, they don't have it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did uh <laughs> I, Perry, I, I think Tara showed me a picture that you had uh, you posted of uh, all the movies you watched on the Criterion Channel this year. <laughs> yes. yes, yeah, my annual Christmas uh, New Year's Eve Facebook post. Yes, <laughs> she was excited that Croupier was on there. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's good. It's good to revisit that. So, in any event, that was kind of the the preamble to why I was hoping to, or happy to get both of you guys on tonight. Uh, but we did probably want to start a little with baseball talk. And our excuse for having you on, Kevin, we, we look for any excuse. But uh, Fangraphs just uh, published last week the Tigers prospect list. And being a Tigers podcast, we figured we'd talk to you about it. Yeah, you got to find something to talk about. Making baseball content is really hard these days. I saw. Oh. Well, yeah, we are in the midst of a lockout. I, apparently, the, the players are going to meet with the ownership group uh, on Monday, in which you could point it'll be like oh you know they couldn't come to an agreement we'll kick it down the road another two weeks and then i don't know we're gonna we're gonna end up with spring training being played by strictly minor leaguers which actually is kind of fun for me if it didn't also involve not having a major league season (laughs) no absolutely if you got tickets go like minor league backfield games are a blast i i highly recommend it yeah there was uh speaking of the minor leagues there was news that came out this uh, tonight that the triple a is going to be using robot umps and the season's coming up, so yeah, let's get ready for that. That's not <sighs> no, not no. I was being sorry. That's because that's such a like. I went the last year. I saw the the robot umps in action for the first couple of games, and the strike zone was so out of whack, and you see the, yeah. the frustration right away. And some of the players just like, or even the delay in the booth where they're trying to make a call, and the umpire's like looking back, and what's it going to be? So yeah, that, I, I'm not looking forward to that at all. Right, there's unintended consequences to everything, and and you know I know everyone's like, oh, robot ups now, robot ups now, and and um, for everyone I've talked to who's you know been in those leagues and you know talking about like you know the teams and and managers and play like it's just the technology itself just kind of not ready for prime time. 
Um, and so you can want that and it's fine, but it actually has to work and it doesn't really work that well yet. And and I'm fine with the fact that they're still testing it and doing the Myers. That's, that's understandable, but um, it can be a real hot mess sometimes. Yeah. I mean, any one of us has, has dealt with technological issues. I, I got a, a privacy warning on my Wi-Fi the other day. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, somebody might be spoofing my IP address. I'm like, well, how do I stop that? I don't know. Um, so somebody's going to spoof the batter's box, and then you're in for trouble. But uh, so, uh, no, I, I, oh, well, go ahead, Raj. Well, I was just going to say I wanted to start with the, the top five, especially at number five at Christian Santana, because Chris and I were talking about this earlier. We haven't had a chance to see him, and the MB number five. That's a bold statement because it's. We're looking at in the last t- decade of the Tigers here, you have, of course, Willie Adamas, and we talked about this uh, with Flores, and some of the Tigers infield prospects in the early days. It's few and far between. Omar Infante and Ramon Santiago as regulars. A regular, quote, but it's been a while that even I, I was still going to see top 100 prospect, but see Santana is the real deal. I mean, obviously, they have him that high. I mean, Chris Santana is really interesting. You put him at five because of the ceiling. Um, like with any of these guys, like, you know, even like Jackson Job at three, you're in a situation where, uh, I mean, look, it's an 18 year old, right? The, 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 the list of things that can go wrong between where Christian Santana and Jackson Job are now and them doing something important in front of 30,000 people in Detroit is eight miles long, right? Um, and, and it's just, and, and your biggest enemy is time. You know, they're 18 years old. They're not nearly ready. And they're probably not going to be for like in the perfect world three years and more likely four to six. And so, you know, the, the thing about Santana is um, dude can just rake guys. Um, it's the real guy who can really hit. It's like a, this is what his calling card was, you know, even as an amateur when, when, you know, before he signed, it was like, man, this kid can hit. And he, you know, and he gets signed, he goes to the DSL and what do he do? He hit, you know, he, 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 he didn't make outs. So it was a really advanced approach. Uh, you know, kind of a shocking amount of power out of him. So all of a sudden he can hit. Now he can hit balls hard too. That's great. He's not a slam dunk shortstop. I think he'll stay there for a while and maybe even get there as a big leaguer. If he progresses right, he's never going to win a gold glove there, but he's athletic enough to stay up the middle, but you're just kind of betting on, on a bat there right now. And, um, you know, he hasn't even been here yet. You know, he spent the whole year in, in the Dominican and, uh, you know, he did not do the, the the tigers instructional stuff and that that could have been partially a function of the pandemic and getting guys into the country and out is a real pain in the butt right now so you know he you stayed in the dr he's probably gonna you know he'll be you know in lakeland for in, in, next month uh when minor league camp starts and that'll be like kind of his first kind of exposure to stateside baseball whether he starts the year in low a i bet he probably stays in lakeland for a while and does the extended thing he's real young and inexperienced but I, you know, it's easy to look at him and go, this is what a plus bat looks like, you know, and this is, this is a kid who, you know, it, it's, it, it's, a, there's an exercise that, that, you know, my, my, my partner in crime on the Tigers list, Eric Longenhagen always likes to, to put us through, which is like, if this kid was in the draft, he's 18 years old. If this kid was in the draft, where would he go? Right. It's a slam dunk first round pick, you know, mid first or better. Um, the, the bats is, is, you know, it's hard to find a bat this good as a teenager. And the fact that he started to, you know, hit some bombs as well was, was very intriguing. The upside here is really high, but again, you know, super risky. Well, and I, I think that's probably going to be super encouraging for Tigers fans to hear just because, you, you know, for most of us, all we can do is look at the stats and, and looking at stats in the Dominican Summer League is a, is a good way to get completely fooled. <laughs> yeah. hey, look at this guy. He walks a lot. Uh, it's because they couldn't throw a single strike. <laughs> uh, but but it's it's nice to hear it from you guys because uh, I, I know that you've been to the Dominican Republic many times. You probably have people who have actually seen Christian Santana play. Yeah. Uh, no, I have. And it's, it's funny because I'm actually, you know, if, if you want to, you know, go with a deep cut and you talk about a guy like Roberto Campos, I think I'm one of the few people not to work for the Tigers who saw Roberto Campos before he signed as an amateur. Wow. Um, and on a, on a, on a messy field in the Dominican that we got lost on the way to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, you know, when we do these lists, we do talk to people. Um, we talk to people both within the Tigers organization. Um, but more importantly, cause you know, those guys can give you a lot of insight. They're the closest to the players, but it's always good to get, 
um, for lack of a better term, kind of a neutral lens as well. And so we talked to a lot of scouts. And, um, you know, one thing from all my time, I've been to the Dominican around 30 times. Um, and, you know, and one thing from all of that comes from, you know, meeting people and making connections. And so, you know, when, when these international players come up, I can I can reach out uh, you know, via WhatsApp always to people and say, hey, do you see this guy? What do you think of this guy? And, and, and talk to some people who, you know, laid recent eyes on him who can give really strong opinions about him. Uh, yeah, it, it, we were discussing before. It'll be really interesting to see. Like you said, they'll probably do the the extended and and you know rookie ball thing. I think the last Tigers international prospect we we talked about. It. I think Willie Adamas and Domingo Leyva both jumped from the Dominican League straight to Low A, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which and they handled it, which was like you know that's a huge sign. I think, uh, and I think Winslow Perez, who's actually I believe. Christian Santana's cousin came up to low a briefly in his first year. And, and you know, right. for a while there, it looked like he was going to be legit. And now it just kind of looks like, yeah, he might be, you know, a second baseman in a few years, might kind of a Harold Castro high. type. Yeah. yeah. Good, good name. Good name. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I, that's, that's really good insight to have. I guess you mentioned Campos. We might as well talk about him too, since, yeah, that was another complete out of, you know, out of nowhere signing a couple years uh, back. Yeah, and he was one of those guys who, like, no one saw him because he. I, I saw him when I saw him. He, I, you know, if I remember right, he was he had been on the island for days. Like you'd measure it in days. He had just got there, and 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 you know, situation where very shortly thereafter, the the Tigers committed millions to him, and so he wasn't like a guy doing the showcases and 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 doing some of the workouts. He just kind of showed up, impressed and signed. And, and when I saw him, he just it was crazy power for a 16 year old and he's he's brute strong it's very it's incredible strength um and just we're, we're trying to figure out if he's gonna hit you know yeah. he can he can come off as a power goof at times um which is a, you know the term i use for like the guys who just show up and they're gonna hit a ball 800 feet or they're gonna strike out you know and it, what that ratio ends up being is going to determine whether they bomb out in, in low a or turn to joey gallo right and so um <laughs> He is big. He's athletic. It's a good right fielder. He throws fine. Um, and it's just, it's all going to come down to the bat, but he's, he's a, I mean, he's a physical specimen for an 18 year old. I mean, if you they put him on the field, if you were sitting, you know, 30 rows back and he stepped on the big, a big league field, he looked like he belonged, you know, he's six, three, he's 200 he's rounded muscular. He looks like he's, he's got his man strength already. And uh, it's, it's a pretty impressive frame and, and, and the powers, for that age is well, well above average. And, you know, there's 150 kids like this and four of them are going to hit, you know, and we'll see if he's one of them. <laughs> yeah. I recall, uh, interviewing Stephen Moya in the minor leagues and, uh, you know, with his shirt off and being just intimidated by a six oh, yeah. foot six, like sculpted Greek God. And he could, he yeah. still hits the ball 500 feet, but just doesn't do it enough to. Yeah. I'm know, trying to remember what you I don't remember what year I asked for Stephen Moy in a trade with the Tigers. It was like 14, I think, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so I, well, yeah, but the power was was real. It was fun, but yeah, you know. it was six seven two fifty. Yeah, it was, it was all over it. He's he's uh, he's not quite built like a sumo wrestler, but no. Uh, <laughs> um, I, was, I guess. Oh, go uh, ahead, Raj. I was going to say the the other guy I was going to ask about was Warren, Warren Flores, who. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. This is his only third year, third year professional ball, and he was putting up some really good numbers last year. Lakeland did not really have a lot of pitching last year. Uh, he changes he changes mechanics a little bit, added just a leg kick so he drives the ball. But Flores seems like it, it, I know there's maybe a reliever possibility there too. But yeah. overall, his numbers last year were just it, it really really stood out. And when you see him pitch, it's just it seems like for the Tigers they got. They probably caught lightning in the bottle, perhaps. I mean, you got to hand it to the to the Tiger scouting department and their and, and basically their whole draft group. You know, this is uh, a kid who who wasn't drafted in 2020. He was signed as a post draft free agent for twenty thousand um, dollars. Like you said, they did make some mechanical changes. Uh, I, I mean, you say maybe he'll end up in the pen. I, I would bet hard that he ends up in the bullpen. It, it, it just the whole the whole act kind of gives off bullpen vibes, if you will. Um, it's he's not the most the big kid he's not especially athletic um there's some violence to delivery it's it's control over command if that makes sense you know he can he can fill the box but he's not exactly locating he's just kind of throwing a strike and daring you to hit it but you know it's like you said it's it's great stuff it's 93 96 you'll touch an eight it's a it's a plus curve an average slider 
Um, so he has secondary weapons. Um, you know, I can see him being like a seventh and eighth inning type of guy who's coming pretty quick. Uh, and, and, uh, I mean, he looked just, he looked outstanding since he signed. I think he's one of the better finds of, of, of that very large and very weird 2020, um, NDFA group because the draft was only five rounds, but, uh, he's, he's, he's an interesting guy. Yeah, and another one I was uh, impressed to see you guys put up there. It was a guy we kind of, you know, we do our own kind of rankings. We were working with Prospects Live for a while, and we do, we work at Motor City Bengals and all this stuff. We do our own kind of rankings. We were trying to figure out what to do with Bo Brisky. Um, and I, I remember Rogelio and I and two of our friends, uh, James Chipman and um, Jake. I'm blanking. Jake, Jake, Jake Bowes. I'm sorry. Sorry, Jake. Uh, we were watching a Bo Brisky start, and I just remember after like the second or third inning, I remember Jake looking over at James and going, "Like, wait a minute, what is this? Like, this is legit. Yeah. Like, he was like, look at that. That's that was like a good changeup. What's going on here? And uh, yeah, he just it, it, like because he had a really rough first start in West Michigan. Like, ah, this guy, you know, twenty eighth rounder. This is what's going to happen. And then just kind of took off from there. And now he might be a guy who's going to you know <laughs> pitch in the majors as a late twentieth rounder, which the Tigers haven't had since nineteen eighty nine. But yeah, the, you know. Another, you know, again, like there's a few of these guys in the system, like another great find, like you said, 27th round, super small school, um, you know, easy delivery, big body. It's, it's, there's nothing overwhelming about his stuff. You know, it's, it's kind of low nineties though. You'll get to the mids here and there. He'll he'll, he can reach back and get there when he needs to, um, sliders ahead of the curveball, ball, change ups. All right. There's a lot of pitchability here. Like there's a lot of kind of, I'm going to, I have four pitches. I don't know what I'm going to throw, so you don't know what I'm going to throw. And he mixes <laughs> things well. He can locate within the zone. He's 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 advanced for what he can do. Um, he does check some some pitch data boxes for teams. I know teams have have had some, you know interest in him and things like that. And um, you know I don't think Bo Brisky is going to go like start opening day game and and win 18 games for the thing, but like spotting up the back of the rotation, taking the bump 30 times a year, that's a valuable. I mean open market we pay those dudes 12 million dollars so you know i i think he's going to be i you know a good chance to be a, a nice back end arm the one of the questions too that I, was interesting to look at and we we saw this last year in a lot of the games and chris and i were going back and forth is the development staff is completely almost 100 percent overhauled in the last 15 months do you recognize the fingerprints of aj hinch because all these hires are contrary to what the tigers have done Overall, I mean, this goes back to what I remember the rainy Swift days, pre October 20th. And the Astros have a specific profile for players and how that process developed over time. Um, I, I, I try not to look too far because, you know, obviously I know AJ and, and, you know, just be transparent. I consider AJ a friend to this day. And um, I, I try not to do that at times just because I, I feel like I'm looking too much for it. But yeah, sure, a little bit. You know, um, you know, at the same, you know, it's it's. You know, I mean, look, I mean, even though the Tigers, you know, like I wrote in the in the list, they didn't get the five hundred last year. It was still a season I think you would call a success based on you know the process, the, the progress where they made, and that all the directions and all the arrows indicator. And I think all that has AJ Hinch's fingerprints all over it, you know. And and so, I think he certainly played a role in, in kind of coming over and saying, you know, this is, these are the some of the these are some of the things we, are doing in Houston. And we found a lot of success with them, um, and and to kind of be able to, to communicate those things to to the Tigers group, who I think listened to him for good reason, and are, and are starting to to bring some of those things in. Um, you know, there are things that Houston did that were really groundbreaking, and um, you know, much of the league is caught up on this at this point because that's how things work in this world. And um, you know, the, to see the Tigers doing what they're doing, yeah, I definitely see a lot of uh, of AJ's influence just this, just in kind of the. I guess, for lack of a better term, modernization of a lot of things that they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's. I think. I think his influence is definitely there, and and I think at the same time, um, I think you got to give it to their their front office, in, in the sense that, you know, they definitely have some forward thinking people, and 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 you know, they get, I think, often miscast as kind of like this old school dinosaur thinking, that's just because of who the GM is. But you think about, I, mean, I think he leans really hard on a guy like Sam Menzen. Who you know was a real forward-thinking, super modern baseball kind of guy who you know recently got promoted to AGM and and you know definitely has GM potential in my mind and and you know there are people in this in that group in Detroit who you know are are, are very forward-thinking, very advanced and I think you know Detroit becomes like this low-key 
kind of sleeper when you talk about teams that are really doing things right and smart and there's always the classic names you get and no one thinks about Detroit and maybe they should because they are starting to do a lot of those things. <laughs> just to cut in with a, a random fact that I just remembered, uh, Perry and I, we had a, a mutual friend we worked with at, yes. together who actually built the Tigers Caesar database. He was a database architect for us at All Media Guy and, and they hired him away a couple years it's later. And, Caesar? And, yeah, it's called Caesar. Yeah. Yeah, we. I, I, I would love to see a list of. I, I know about six or seven teams' names are, and I would, I would, it'd be fine to see a list of all thirty. Yeah, and it, presumably that's because Mike Illich, Little yeah. Caesars, yeah, uh, unless maybe he's, you know. Remember when we saw Lance part. Parrish uh, had the Caesar? Yeah, up? that was. We we interview. We were interviewing Lance Parrish one time after a West Michigan game, and he was like, you know, filling out the post game yeah. reports and putting them in the Caesar and. Lance Paris was absolutely awesome too, by the way. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to talk to him, but I had, a, that, that, yeah. At some point you're going to laugh really, really hard at something kind of inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess we should probably touch on the top two prospects because that's all that Tigers fans really want to talk about. Um, and and it, it's, there's a little bit of a debate, like, you know, who, who's the number one uh, in the system. And yeah, I believe your sure. comment was, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I, but, that's, but that's true like so yeah. i mean and, and and you know i'll be honest with you, like you know as if you look at the byline it's me and eric long and hagan working together on this and eric and i had a little argument about it like we didn't we went back and forth over who should be one between uh torkelson and riley green and um who cares like they're both real they're both great prospects these are both like these are both big big stud prospects and so who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all, right? No one's going to remember yeah. in a year who was number one and number two. And, you know, hopefully both will be really good in the big leagues. But if one is and one isn't, people aren't, aren't going to remember. It just, who cares? They're both really, really good prospects. They're both, if you want to say, you like, someone says, oh, I think Riley Grish number one. I'm just going to go, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, I'm not, you know, what happened? So, yeah, sure. Okay, I get it. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think these are both, you know, obviously elite level prospects. I, I think they'll, you know, belong in the top 25 or if not higher. Um, you know, top 20 or better on, on, on any overall baseball list. And um, like, these are the kind of guys who, if they both turn out and, and be everything you think they're going to be, which is probably, which is a, not a very likely outcome. And my puppy agrees with this, um, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll trans, they'll transform the organ. They'll transform the lineup. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah. these guys turn to what you think they're doing, they're both going to be, you know, hitting somewhere between two and four in a good lineup, right? These are going to be star level players. And so, um, you know, I think Torkelson, just for me, the offensive upside for him is, um, is terrifying. And, and it's kind of what gave him the slight edge, despite the fact that he's more of kind of a bat only first baseman is like, I think Torkelson, you know, there's MVP upside in that. Like there's, there's consistent kind of, you know, 300, 400, 500 years. And, or, you know, and, and if, there, there's another version of him that turns into this weird kind of 275, 375, 600 player, right? It depends on, you know, where the contact kind of the contact to power ratio ends up in his game. Um, but, but there's, there's huge upside in it. And for, you know, for Riley Green to do what he did as a 20 year old last year, and that's kind of one of the most impressive things about it is the fact that this kid was, you know, was 20 and was getting to the upper levels and just kind of kept ripping it. And so, yeah. you know, that that's the thing that kind of really stands out for, um, you know, a guy like Green. And Green's, you know, Green's not some super freak athlete either who's going to play up the middle. He's going to be a corner guy. And, and, and um, you know, but, but still, like, you know, bat-wise, you know, it's above average hit and above average power minimum for both right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got to see both of them a fair amount this year. I think we saw Torkelson sure. more than than Green. Um, yeah, well, you and the, I were talking about when he was trying to go to right field too in Toledo and like late Tork, part of the, yeah. yeah, Torque was towards the latter part of Erie his time in Erie. Then when we saw him in Toledo, he started trying to go to right to figure out how to go that way. And it was at first we were just wondering. It looked like a struggle. Then Chris, I don't know what it, two, two weeks later, it's just like. Yeah, they was hitting, hitting lasers to the wall in right field. It was kind of funny. And one of my favorite things about Riley Green is uh, he's he's like a fringe average, slightly below average runner, I guess. But he looks he runs like an old cowboy. It's it's this really strange kind of like it's almost bow legged or something like that. And he's like, what's oh, yeah. he doing? But uh, yeah, he's he's a little stiff and athletic, but you know he's a big, strong kid. He can rake. Yeah, and and the thing that Tigers fans, you know, throughout. Uh, 
they saw him a bunch in the summer camp and in spring training and he just kept making these spectacular defensive plays it's like geez this kid is just like you know it, 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 it that's the old you know you wonder if, if a better defender has to dive for that but right. he's still making like he made them all it was like well geez Caught all right ball, he's gonna, yeah yeah so i don't know yeah, it's, it's definitely exciting it's a it's the best uh one two prospect punch i can remember for the tigers certainly both uh position players uh, you could go back to like Maben and Miller, maybe overall prospects, and and that sure. is also a good example of what can happen with prospects. You have one guy who had a pretty darn good MLB career in Cameron Maben, but it was never quite you know the superstar that people thought he could be. And then Andrew Miller struggled forever, and then became one of the best relievers in baseball for like a good five year stretch. So, right. you know, Major League Baseball is hard. It's so hard, guys. I can't begin to talk. <laughs> I, no one, no one appreciates just how good these guys are. They're unbelievably good. I, you know, and, and it was one of the first thing when I first started going to minor league parks, one of the first things that, that struck out to me or stuck out to me, struck out to me, um, was just seeing the guys there working, taking grounders every day at two in the two in the afternoon. And it's like, man, you really have to love baseball to play baseball professionally. Like you don't just show up and play the game. You're like, you're putting in hours of work before the game. And if you're a pitcher, you're sitting on your ass, not sitting on your ass, but like, it's got to be boring as hell for four days. You just made every pitcher hate you. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they, you know, I remember seeing Buck Farmer doing weightlifting and stuff in between starts, but like, <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a great, it's a great kind of myth that like, oh, I, mean, I wish I'd, I'd play a game for free three hours a day. And like, it, you know, big leaders show up the park for a night game after lunch and they leave around midnight. And it's, you know, it's a real, it's a real commitment, a real grind. Those guys do work hard and, and the overwhelming majority of them do love playing baseball. Yeah, you yeah. were talking to Jeff last week about that, like uh, how these people are like, oh, yeah, I, I, it was a kid's game and that cliche that's been going on for uh, it's such a it's so, right. so stupid after a while. Right. Like, Nobody hey, wants to watch you play baseball. I don't care. Go watch a softball game. And it, right. it's like it's pretty easy to see that this is not a yeah, quality right. product here. Right. Exactly. I, mean, I, did. I, I, I meant like a, you know, like a men's beer league softball. Like, yeah, these aren't. Yeah, I managed one of those teams for seven years, and I hated every <laughs> moment of it. No, because think, no, no, seriously, there's and yet you did it for seven years. <laughs> what are you doing, butter maker? Well, here's okay. L no, wait a second. No, 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 no. Back up here. You managed like a softball team for seven years. Yeah, you hated every moment of it. <laughs> yeah, and my to this day, my hey. wife. <laughs> and after your first year, you went, yeah, I might give us a shot again, and then you did that six more times. Yeah, you know why? Because I'm a glutton for punishment. But also at the same time, it was my way of quote unquote staying in fi and staying in fitness. And I love, and there's no hard league baseballs around here. The leagues are yeah. playing, so that was my only outlet. And I love playing the sport. But you have douchebags coming up to me going, you know, uh, I bat four sixty five at second uh, when I bat second. How the hell are you? I'm not even keeping stats. I'm just putting that you hit two for four, and then you hit a junk double. Get the hell out of here, man! Like I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, again. D class D beer softball in Garden City, Michigan. Ooh. <laughs> Perry, then you, Perry, you did you? Teams, then you have teams that are class A teams that are on ESPN playing us as for scrimmage. Get the hell out of here! <laughs> there was crap. I don't know, Perry. Did you ever play softball Seven at AMG? Years. Uh, I, uh, I mean, not when you there, there was like a regular league going on for a while. There, right? Before like, I got like, there, it seemed like there was a regular league, and then I, yeah, I no. played for a couple years. Uh, and in the biggest asshole on the team was a guy who would sometimes play pause at the Tigers game. He would be, he'd dress up as the mascot. Oh, good and God. he was the, he was the guy who thought it was like game seven of the world series every right. game. Exactly. Um, yeah. So okay. I don't know. Uh, really, do we have any more prospect questions? I, I had one more that I want to talk about the list. Uh, yeah, we did have, uh, we had one from actually from the audience that uh, that was a good one from Pat. Who's uh, right over at pitchers list. Oh What's yeah, your opinion yeah. On the idea that the AL Central minus Chicago is at the beginning of an interesting arms race in terms of prospects and young talent. Uh, you know, it's a fun question. Like, I think I think obviously right now, the White Sox are the class of that league or that division rather. Um, but it's interesting just kind of how many teams are like we talked about Detroit. Everything's trending in the right direction, right? It's really easy to see the Royals getting better. Um, it's, I think, you know, I'm not saying the twins should have won the central last year, but what happened to them last year, I think was a bit of an anomaly and they shouldn't have been that bad. Um, so it's easy to see the twins being better next year. It's easier to see the Royals getting better next year. It's easy to see the tigers being better again next year. Um, Cleveland, like, I don't know. You never know when they're going to like dump whoever's going to make about, you know, anything over the big league minimum. So you don't, it's just, they're hard to, 
they're hard to you know, project what they're going to do in the future. But there's all sorts of teams kind of in the moving in the right direction. They're kind of nipping at the White Sox heels, and whether they catch them, you know, this year or next is a good is a really good question. But uh, you know, the, the the bad teams in the in the American League Central all seem like they're they're at least on a decent path to not, not be bad for long. Uh, including the Tigers, and so it, it's it's. I think it could end up a real interesting division because the White Sox don't have a great system right now, and so that's for really good reasons. You trade your prospects away to make a really good big league product, and they won the division, and um, you know, and and so they did the right thing. But uh, you know, the question is like, how long does that window stay open while these other teams are are actively trying to close it? Um, but I, I think the division could become, it might maybe even earlier this year, but I would probably guess more in twenty three. Like, could become super compelling real quick. Yeah, one of the things that kind of sticks out to me is is uh, Cleveland's got kind of a sneaky good farm system with guys yeah, that aren't all system. that far away. Yeah, no, uh, it is a good system. They got guys coming. It's just it's just it's just a weird team where like it's like all of a sudden they're going to trade this guy because they got to get rid of him. I'm like, yeah, you got to get rid of the guy making three million. Like, I, you know, it's it's I get it's I get times are tough, but I mean, come on. And um, so I just think they're hard to project when it seems like they're always trying to it's really hard to be good and rebuild at the same time like i, I found like you either kind of uh, under the current rule set which hopefully will change the new cba but under the current rule set um you know you either need to be rebuilding or going for it if you're kind of doing both you're kind of half-assing both mm -hmm. and so it, it becomes like this weird thing and i think cleveland is always trying to walk this tightrope and it's just way too much of a challenge to be honest with you yeah, I mean, from from the outside, it, it feels like they almost like they can produce Cy Young quality pitchers. Oh, they uh, grow arms on trees there. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It, it, <laughs> but I but I do wonder if there might be a like at some point there might be hubris involved that they think they could do. You know, they'll trade trade their fourth consecutive Cy Young winner away, and suddenly they don't have any pitching ever again. Yeah, but, it can get real scary real quick. So, um, the, the one one question I I had left, and not necessarily about the list, but the Tigers drafted a boatload of pitchers uh, last year. Because I think they needed to. Their their pitching depth got pretty thin, um, and I was just curious if there were any of the the later round. You know, they took Jackson Job. Everybody's excited about him. Ty Madden was you know fell to them. That was that was kind of cool uh, for the Tigers fans. But uh, like you know, some of the the later round guys. I don't know if there were any of those guys that you particularly liked, like the uh, I know the kid from what is it uh, South Carolina Central or whatever. I mean, I mean, we saw at the top just the sense that I was a huge Ty Madden fan all spring, okay, and, yeah. and I, I I understood why he dropped. There was some. I don't want to say weird pitch data with him, but there was some pitch. There were certain aspects to his, you know, advanced pitch metrics, if you will, is his kind of, um, yeah, his pitch, pitch data that would turn teams off, right? Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, I'm like, this is this is, you know, I know this like it's an old school scout who always said this, and it's always it's always echoing in my head, uh, and I'm fine sounding like an old school scout for a second, but and he always it's, he's got a bit of a kind of a south midwest accent if you will so like, you know like, like that <laughs> oklahoma voice you go this is what they look like this is what they look like right i mean this is like power frame power shit and enough command to, 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 to threaten guys in the zone I, I was like i just the fact that, that guy didn't stay in the first round just shocked me i still think it's one of the steals in the draft um i'll give you a dude who i actually really think is is weird and interesting um who also is a trivia question for me um mm -hmm. The last amateur player I saw as a professional talent evaluator, the last college game I went to, um, and this was, you know, before things went to shit with COVID, uh, I went to a tiny JUCO in Oklahoma uh, and at uh, right next to the Travis Hafner Fieldhouse. And oh. um, like middle of nowhere, like you stayed in Wichita and it was a 90 minute drive from there. And they were playing Iowa Western which is um, which is actually a JUCO powerhouse in baseball. Mm -hmm. um, tons of those kids go to D1. Tons, a lot of those kids have gone pro. Um, and uh, I wasn't there to see him. I was there to see like three other kids. This kid wasn't even on my list to see the kids to see. But Iowa Western, like halfway through the game, went to the pen, and they brought in this kid named Tanner Colehep. And mm -hmm. he took them out. I was like, it was weird. I held up a radar gun, and I had you know a fancy radar gun that does spin rate too. I'm like, oh, shit, this is really weird. Um, and I wrote him up and like the last scouting report and amateur I put in was Tanner Cole, who I, I, wow. thought he was, I thought he was super interesting. It was like, Hey, he's going to Notre Dame. I'm like, yeah, this is crazy. Interesting. Um, he generates spin rates on a two seam fastball that some guys can't do with a slider. Um, it's, it's wow. insane. He does, it's, it's huge spin on a two seam fastball 
uh, and it moves because of that. He is all arms and legs, the funky delivery. He doesn't repeat it well. He can't always throw strikes. But he's got this weird, strange, very well-performing two-seam fastball um, that I think just makes him an interesting guy who might land a pen at some point. So, yeah, Tanner Kolhoff's my sleeper from the 2021 draft. Nice. Yeah, that's that's a guy that we actually uh, – we kind of all – dug into him recently and we're like yeah this is this is kind of fun because you know there there were you know he was hitting the mid 90s i think up 97 98 at times um yeah he was more low when i saw him but i do know he gained some velocity in this last year so yeah i mean that's it's, it's you never know with bullpen arms they could rocket through the system or they could you know flame out in double a mm. or or rocket through the system and then flame out in double a um yeah, that, that's my dude tanner cole um and there was one other uh, thing I wanted to get, and this is just kind of a, a, a personal perspective thing. We, you know, we talked to you last year around the same time, and I think February, you just yeah, February, yeah. just kind of started there at Fangraphs. Um, and then, you know, in your previous life, you were a baseball executive, and in the previous life before that, you were doing prospect stuff again. And I, I'm just kind of curious um, what has changed about the industry that you've noticed, you know, from the first, uh, I don't know, over 10, 15 years you were doing it compared to now, and, and what how working in actual baseball uh, changed the way you view things. Um, well, Twitter isn't as fun as it used to be. That's um, true. Yes. Yeah. It's a lot angrier. Yeah. Um, I still have some fun on Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think. I, I mean, look, I mean, when I, whatever, before I went to work for the Astros, like, you know, I thought we had one of the best baseball podcasts out there, but we also had one of the only baseball podcasts out there, right? Yeah. And now, you know, it's a decade later, and if you have a microphone, you have a podcast, and if you're a middle-aged white male, you have a, it's, 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 I think it's in the law right now, you have to have a podcast, <laughs> right? It's, it's, yeah. part of the, it's part of Joe Biden's Build Back Better thing. Right? He's, <laughs> he's sending everyone mass COVID tests and podcast <laughs> microphones. Um, and so, you yeah, know, there's a lot more of them out there. Um mm -hmm. You know, and that's part. There's a lot more people doing prospect coverage, um, and I and there's some people out there who I think are really good, but I, there's some people who I don't. So I think there's more good prospect coverage and there's more bad prospect coverage, but I think it creates some confusions for fans. To be honest with you, just because there's, you know, if I think right now if you wanted to, I'm not going to do it while we talk, but if you like Google Tigers prospect lists, you know, I think you'd find like five or six Willie what really well researched really really well thought out prospect list that have a really interesting lens and some things that you can learn from and you'd probably find 10 or 11 like ones that just read everybody else's and use that and you know and 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 you know didn't and couldn't tell you what these guys look like and so um you're, you're kind of there's there's a lot more signal but also a lot more noise in the prospect world and so um you know it, it's up to the readers to decide for themselves who they what they think is good and bad so i think just that there's just so much more I, I think is the answer and a lot of it's great and and that's one that's not but you know i think that's part of it um i think just one thing i've learned in in um you know as, as i approach a, you know, a full year at fangraphs is as and that i didn't anticipate um was just like how like really really interested people are in um in learning how the sausage is made um mm -hmm. in in terms of front office work and and i didn't think that yeah. would be like, like people are fascinated with they all that there's like it's the overwhelming number of questions i get in my chats and um you know when i write about it people love it and they want more of that kind of stuff i didn't realize that was going to be the case um you know and, and i was really fortunate to kind of dip my toes in all sorts of waters in the front office and actually have experience with all these kind of things and um, you know, I was involved with the draft. I was involved with all the pro stuff and then dropped in trades and free agency and, and even did some trade and free agent negotiations with agents and, you know, went to Dominican and was doing a lot of crap. I was able to touch a lot of things and see how things work. And, um, and people are really interested in that stuff. And so that's been a lot of fun to, to and, and surprising really, because I thought I'd just be talking about baseball. People kind of, you know, they want to understand like what goes into these decisions and how things really work in there. And, you know, sometimes they're disappointed to hear how they really work in there, but it, I think it's interesting uh, that, that, that they find out. I mean, you, you talk about the podcast element, and one of the things that the reason why you, at the top of the show I compliment your podcast is because, quite frankly, a lot of these podcasts aren't produced well. They don't know how to use Audacity. <laughs> they don't know what a fade in and fade out is. They don't know how the intro music is. They don't know how the break works. They put the ad markers, which sometimes I'm admittedly, it's not my fault, but sometimes they go right in the middle of me saying something. So to me, Kevin, you're, you're absolutely right. Everybody has a podcast, yada, yada, yada. I think a lot of pride in the fact that 
I'm one of the uh, we've been doing this since 2011. Chris and I've been this since 2016 together, and it's all about it. it what stands out is the production value because it it, just, it makes a difference. It really does. And so when it really does, yeah. Yeah, it's ahead. funny, like when I started doing this again, I, I remember telling uh, Dylan Higgins, who does, who, who produces Effectively Wild, who I talked to just to kind of figure out how to put this thing up on the Fangraphs ecosystem and stuff. And I said, Dylan, I said, I said, Dylan, look, I haven't done this for for eight years. I I used to just do everything on Audacity, and he went, "We're all still using Audacity." I went, "Okay, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> this, is, this is great. This is great news." Yeah. yeah. And wait, I wait, mean, don't you use something else though, Raj? So I use the script. A... I, so I use the script, and I use uh, Adobe Audition because when I was in mm-hmm. In school, the big thing was audition, and audacity is the same thing, but it's just um, l- less bells and whistles. And audition, you can do multi track editing easier than you can. Mm. Uh, the script I just Pains started finding out what was nice is because it takes out the filter words and also does some creepy, Kevin. I don't know if you've heard about what the script does. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. So it takes, like, let's say you talk for 10 minutes into a script, then you send it over to them, and they make an artificial voice of your voice based off what you read, and so. For one of the narrations that they did for the Tiger Minor League Report Channel, I used my voice because I was sick at the time, and it was whole narrated by me. But I sound very robotic, obviously, because it wasn't me. I just <laughs> typed it in, and they used my voice for it. And sometimes I use that because I flutter my words sometimes, but um, it also has a really nice stereo sound to it. But either way, um, but this. What are you doing, great. Dave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, yeah. I appreciate you saying about the show. Like I don't, I don't add. Like you know, I, it's um. You know, I'm going to give away something about Effectively Why, which is a great show, like with 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 Meg and Ben. But you know, Dylan, like like Ben, um, Ben Lindbergh is is you know if you, to know Ben's love him, but he's a little anal about things, and I guess he like sits there and keeps like a running track of things as they podcast, right? And it's like uh, with a timestamp, right? It'll be like 14:31, um, like 14:42, uncomfortable pause, like you know 14:53, <laughs> stuttered a little bit, and 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 that gets removed by the you know he keeps that i don't i i mean my tracks are are clean like i re, like we hit record we hit stop everything that happened in that's going in right i'll do noise reduction i'll clean up levels yeah, and, and i'll yeah. make it sound good but like i don't edit any sounds out other you know i'll edit mouse clicks out but like if you if i um or whatever like it just rolling you know why I don't have the goddamn time to do that shit man <laughs> no and and that's why no. I, I meant like just the noise reduction stuff because a lot of guys just record and go all right i don't have to worry about noise reduction or fade yeah, in or no. fade out no i try to but, make it clean yeah you had to make it clean and so that's basically that the only time i ever use the uh, uh filter is when i'm i'm on 15 hours of just straight working and i haven't slept yet so but anyway i just that's that's a big deal among these podcasters that, that, that there's a difference and that's why when you see yours ranked in the top five and chartable versus i mean we're always in the top 50 and that's nice but wait I, a second am i in the top five on what on Char- oh, you never you never heard about this chartable let me I know, i'll hold this up um so yeah chartable your your show is regularly top 10 in all of baseball podcasts did you not know that no, no idea. Made yeah. my night though that's great oh nice. yeah so i'm gonna I'll, I'll pull it up right now yeah there's a there's a national list and every uh, i i've um the other chris and i found it a couple of years ago when somebody told me we were 19th ranked on this list and i said what and i had no idea there was somebody was talking about this and so uh, ever since then, I sw- um, it's a free service you can sign up for, and I'm going to share here on the screen. So, yeah, so your podcast, so number one podcast is the podcast right now at the moment, but I don't even know what that is. Yeah. yeah, so check this out. So a lot of John Boy Media, because they have 800 podcasts are uh, right. up there. Um, yeah, you're number, number 22 right now. Yeah, number 22. Down four, down and, four. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, you know, your next episode comes out tomorrow, right? So probably... Right. Tomorrow or Saturday, uh, it'll probably be back up in the top five. Um, yeah, look, I mean, we're, for being an indie podcast, we're let's see, locked on Tigers on right now, but locked on's always doing they do podcasts every day, so I can't really, but uh, anyway, um, I'll check this out. Oh, you may be, yeah, fan grass is audio, yeah. So there's 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 a good friend of the show, Cody Saberhagen, there up there as well. Oh, yeah, and, Cody. yeah, so it's 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 a cool thing and uh, it's a free service you can look up and check out anytime, and so um. Yeah. Uh, Great. <laughs> I did. Uh, we did get what, like th- three other questions I saw. I was um, that's with my numbers all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh, Our buddy. We're down a little bit, but it's okay. No that's fine. fine. I'll, I'll bring yeah. you up. I, I want to talk about this a bit. Yeah. Our, our, our buddy, Deadly, Nin- Deadly Ninja Bees, 
Oh, that's a, such a great Said, so do you see any any way an international draft could work? Signing kids at 16 from poor countries seems creepy to me. Um, and I predicted yeah. what your answer would be, Kevin. I'd love to know what you predicted. I mean, my, my, my answer is define work. <laughs> yeah, well, I, my, my, my answer was it's creepy as hell as it is. So, like, do you see any way an international draft could work? Like, what do you mean by work? Um, like, it's yeah. I, at first, I mean, I, I, you know, I, let me just say this like, international draft is, is definitely no longer an if, it's a when. Um, I think we'll see it in the next CBA. Um, I think just because of like where we are in, in terms of market cycles, it'll, you'll probably have your first one in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's going to happen. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, again, like, I don't know what you mean by work. It's going to happen. There's going to be an international draft. There's going to be drafted players. There's going to be um, like a slotted bonus pool. It will not be like it's going to be slotted bonus slots as opposed to like the pool we have in the amateur draft where you can kind of move that money around. This is going to be more like maybe other sports where it's like, you know, the number 73 pick gets this much money, period. Um, I think it's going to be 10 to 15 rounds. There will be kind of a weird free agents, free agency thing after the draft with a bonus cap. Um, like work i I still don't know like does the current system work like i don't it's 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 tough to it depends how you define work yeah work's a weird word here (laughs) yeah i I don't really know yeah international draft's gonna happen deadly ninja bees but like work (laughs) (laughs) like i don't know what works yeah and and i think uh yeah my my argument was that it's uh things are just as creepy if not creepier right now than they would be in a, in a draft of 16 year olds i don't know if there would be any less or any more creepy uh, i mean there's certain things that are less creepy just in the sense that you're not you know if you're drafting kids at 16 you're not going to be trying to sign ones that are 12 yeah um you know and so that's yeah. good um you know it's it's maybe we shouldn't you know let better be the enemy of good um so i think that's one mild positive out of it there you go. Um, I did have so we did have a question that was uh, this is for Perry actually for all all four oh. of us in the room. So we do have a question from Youper. I thought the Tender Bar was one of the better films I saw over the past year. Would love to hear a, crit- a critic's opinion or the, essentially the four of us. I haven't seen the movie, so I cannot. <laughs> Neither have I. I asked Perry about it before the show, and he said I haven't gotten to it yet either. I, I need to. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm interested. I I think Clooney's an interesting director. Meaning incredibly uneven and probably has never made a great movie, but I, I'm curious. It has Ben Affleck in it, so I can't watch it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, you've got your people were always confronting you about Matt Damon too on the chat too, or at least they used to be. It was kind of funny. Um, try, try to avoid him as well. <laughs> I mean, I thought uh, what was it? Contagion. That was a pretty good movie, right? Yeah, the, the argument is that Matt Damon has never been in a movie that was great. No. Oh, the I would argument, disagree. The argument I would disagree hold, hold wildly, water. But that's I know, but that's and but you'd be you'd be wrong, and that's okay. <laughs> no, um, no, the departed but, is great. The Coen Brothers is that, true the Coen Brothers true grit is great. Um, no, okay, so the, the, so the departed is is good and, and on and on the Scorsese scale average at best. And true grit is like I don't even know it's like top ten Coen Brothers movie, and yet it's still good. But it's not great. Like you're talking about, like it's like what are the weak points in, in the Coen the Brothers? The talented Scorsese? Mr. Ripley is great. It's good. It's not great. But no. like, what's the what is your weak point in the Coen Brothers work and the Scorsese catalog? It's the Matt Damon uh, movies. That's your answer. No, the Matt Damon no, movie. no, no, Lady Killers. Lady Killers is the weak point of the Coen Brothers. Films like, by, like, what's your by po- a wide margin? Yeah, you know what didn't work out when they worked with Matt Damon. That didn't work out. <laughs> That's what it did. There is no. There is it only no works in Kevin Smith movies, apparently. There is no weak point for Scorsese. There's none. Sorry. That's that's absolutely not true. I mean, yeah, he's 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 made he's done some okay stuff. It's okay. I love uh, the guy, but he's done some okay stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I think we could probably just move right into movie talk now because it's already happened uh, organically. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I don't know what ride head for you but generally perry i just go uh so what you watching what did you watch what's good (laughs) what's good well 
Uh, I it's weird. My year, as I've gotten older and older, I don't live by the calendar year anymore. I live by the Oscar year. So there's stuff I still need to see uh, from from 2021. Uh, but what I've seen so far, uh, boy, I'm I'm one of the few who seems to think Don't Look Up is absolutely brilliant. I, I think that film's superb. I I love where where uh, 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 I'm t- utterly blank. Jeff Lawrence. I don't know why. No. Adam McKay. Yes, I can't. Okay. Uh, you know, I I love where Adam McKay is. I can't think of a director who's evolved like he has. And I think this is, this caps a three run series of films that makes him utterly unique. Uh, I'm, I, I love it. I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a masterpiece. I think it's really it's great. A, yeah. I think it's a perfectly average film. It, like I was, it, I watched it. I laughed a few yeah. times. I thought it was, it was, it was kind of, I thought it was like pointless and aimless and didn't really know what it wanted to be and kept trying to be like funny and then serious and like trying to make a point while being funny. And it kind of, I think it hit a lot of really dull moments. I felt like he tried so many times and failed to be like a 2021 Dr. Strangelove. Um, oh, yeah. And like, oh, I agree. You know, and I just want to sit back and kind of go, yeah, you're no Kubrick, pal. Um, <laughs> and it was, I just thought it, I really thought, I kind of like, I'm like, I appreciate what he's trying here so much that I want to give him credit, but he's, he's swinging and missing a lot. Um, uh, see, for me, in satirizing where we are as a as a I, yeah, culture, I thought it was, again, like I didn't a, think it was a, I didn't think it was a bad movie. I was like, that's fine, that's fine. I think that's trying to satirize where we are right now as a culture, and I don't think it's satire. I think it's something a little more than that. Honestly, is yeah, it's really uh, hard is to it, do satire right now? Is a bigger swing than just making fun of the military, which and I Strange Love is fantastic. Strange Love is perfect, but it's aiming at something that's real easy to hit. <laughs> yeah, I, I I see what you're saying, uh, but at least he hit it. Yeah, I just, I just, I, again, like I didn't hate the movie. It's just like it was a fifty. It was, it was, it was fun. I, yeah, from you know, I watched it and I enjoyed it. I I I took particular enjoyment in in some of the smaller parts in it, like Jennifer Lawrence not being able to let go of the fact that the general it's the best part char- of the movie. Char- char- <laughs> char- <laughs> I, I was like, that's just fantastic. That's uh, the best part of the movie is but yeah, I, I you know. Charging, right. Sometimes when I watch a movie, I'll go after and I'll, I'll read some reviews just to see what other people thought, and they were all over the map. And I was like, "Wow, this is kind of wild." Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was great. I, I didn't think it was offensively bad. I thought it was fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it was like 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 True Gooder the Departed. It was fine. <laughs> No, and, and I was tell, telling you earlier, Perry, that I had start. I watched like the first hour and twenty minutes of the Power of the Dog today, but I couldn't finish it because I had to go pick up my son from school. And, and you it, said the, the last thirty minutes is probably kind of important there. So I need the see. final thirty on that. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Continue, Perry. I don't know what else uh, you wanted to no, touch on. I, I really love Power of the Dog. Uh, the one that's lingered all year for me is the Green Knight. I thought the Green Knight was fantastic. I wish people. Yeah. Would. Give that a look. And I loved, uh, as long as we're talking about films nobody saw, I loved The Card Counter. I thought Paul Schrader's film was uh, really good. And I can't remember the last time he put together two films back to back as as good as that yeah. and First Reformed. So, and not that it's as good as First Reformed, because that's about, that's one of the two best films he's ever directed. Uh, but boy, I thought The Card Counter was really strong. I don't even think I heard of it. I but that's, I've, that's how I've I work. Heard of it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Did not but see I'm, The Green Knight. Yeah, we, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of on a list. We saw the the new Cohen Macbeth thing over the weekend. Um, it's like 80 visuals and sound, but like it's 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 kind of a tough commitment because it's I didn't even realize this going in. It's it's I mean it is a it is a movie production of the play. It is Shakespeare's words performed as the yeah. play, right? Mm. Um, I did not know that going in. I thought it was like a Coen Brothers take on, on the story of Macbeth, and I didn't realize it was like a, a straight shot of, of that. That said, like if you have like my middle age crisis is like really nice audio visual stuff in my living room, so I have a very nice setup in terms of television and sound. Um, and if you have that. Like it's it's a lot of fun. Like it's it's beautifully filmed. It looks like a kind of a, it looks like if you know if you gave Bergman a four K film like camera like which is what he'd come up with. It's it's really stark contrast, black and white. The sound's phenomenal. Um, like I was compelled by it. It's just at times you're like going, 
I don't know what he just said. He's, he's going to do what kind of stuff? Like, I, like, <laughs> who's thou in this one? Like, and it's just it, the language is it's a challenge of somebody that like, didn't you know didn't study Shakespeare and, and is not a big Shakespearean guy. Um, but I did like it. Um, I, I do have to like cut out soon, but like, what's your deep cut? Your I want to give a Criterion Channel deep cut, and I want you to give one too. Oh, all right. Give me a second to bring up my list of everything I've seen on the channel because I keep it. Okay, I'll go. Like Just to pick my, something really my, good. Yes, please go. My, cri my Criterion Channel deep cut is the Lure, which is a oh yeah, which is a Polish vampire movie. <laughs> Pol I'm sorry, a Polish stripper vampire movie. Oh. Um, is so good. It was such an enjoyable little flick about these two women, who, uh, mermaid vampire, something yeah, Polish stripper mermaid vampire movie. If you're not in just off that, like I, I another one I, of those, I, I have no time for you. Yeah, it's derivative, but I know there's a lot of <laughs> Polish mermaid vampire movies, stripper vampire movies out there. Um, that's one of my more, most enjoyable things I saw this year, actually. Let's see something from I do this have. Year. I actually wanted to mention one of them, which was uh, there was two movies that came to mind when I uh, on the Critic Collection, which surprised me which was Poison Ivy, because I remember seeing that yeah. in, in high school, and that was like something I saw late at night, and it was like, it seemed like a... Poison Ivy, let me see. Yeah, that's... The Drew uh, Barrymore... Yeah. Uh, Lolita-esque yeah. thriller. And the, is, it came in the, the wake of uh, the Joey Buttafuoco shooting. Uh, <laughs> and it was like, yeah. there were like three films real quick that were all kind of about that, and oh. that, was the, that was the best one of the three by far. I, and, I thought yeah, they were all made for TV. Yeah, mm. and that's, what, that's what surprised me about it, Perry, because I didn't expect that to be on there. I didn't think it was uh, that good of a movie. And one of my favorite movies of all time is Rear Window with Alfred Hitchcock. <sighs> I love that movie. That's such a Hitchcock's best. The best it is. Yeah, I got that. There's a. I, I got a DVD set for it uh, at Best Buy. It was on clearance, like ten bucks, and it had all these his movies, and I couldn't believe how cheap it was. And uh, yeah, that, that that's a career ten. That's my deep cuts for career ten as far as that goes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's still up there or not. But the one a, a film I had always meant to get to and finally did last year was uh, Cutter's Way, the Irving mm -hmm. Pissar sort of noir from early '80s with Jeff Bridges. Uh, that's oh. really good. <laughs> I'm I I regret it took me 48 years to finally see it. It's 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 really good. It's, very it's, yeah, very it's great that, LA yeah. noir. A twist on that. It's in imagine. Uh, imagine Lebowski if it wasn't funny, and right. this is supposed to be. I mean, it's, you know, it's... yeah, right. This, right. The, this is the year I finally saw like the taking of Phelan one, two, three, like the early. Oh, it's so the good! One. It's first, yeah. first time I ever saw it. Like this is one of those things I never saw. I should watch this. Yeah, yeah. It's good. So, uh, so Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. We're Perry and I and Chris are going to carry on the movie conversation, and so Chim Music's dropping a new episode tomorrow. Who? Are you, you want to plug that? Who's who's your guest, or what do you got? Co-host is Ben. co is Ben Clemens. Talk a little bit about labor. Talk a little about uh, Seiya Suzuki. We talk about weird box score lines. We talk about I talk about the Macbeth thing. Ben talks about some books. We play music by Mirror Box. Uh, we have weird emails about agents. It's a good time. We talk about <laughs> Carlos Correa switching agents. Oh yeah, that's. I think I'm gonna have to send you an email. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but it's something that we touched on recently. I, I I don't know why it took me this long to realize, but there are a lot of there are a lot of Latin American baseball players who have names of ancient Greek philosophers, and I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know I, if you can help me or not. <laughs> I actually have an answer to that. Oh, really? Podcast. I will. I will email the podcast. So outstanding. All right, Sounds Kevin. Good. Thanks so much for Thanks, joining. Us. We appreciate it, man. Thanks, guys. You. Appreciate. It. Have nice a good one. Kevin. You too. All right. That's a nice so, preview. Yeah, that's a nice preview of the things to come. So Kevin was so Perry. kind to join us. And uh, Perry, the reason why I, well, there was a couple of questions in terms of movies, I, I, I know you have to watch a little bit of everything, correct? Like, uh, like luckily, I'm okay, at a cool. part of my life where I get to pretty much see whatever I want, so I can avoid oh, nice. a lot of stuff that I didn't have to in years past. But yes, I try to keep up on every, even if I don't care, I, I I do try to keep up with what's current, although. I'll, if I never see another Marvel movie, I won't be surprised. <laughs> so that's what I was going to ask you about. Not a Marvel movie, but it was a nostalgia uh, tug to the or tug of the heartstrings. Apparently, that was a new Ghostbusters Afterlife movie, and I watched it in the theaters, and I wanted to be disappointed, and I came away not. I came away going, well, I didn't know really. I didn't have a clear cut impression of it. I guess to me, it. I did, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Based off the recent events with my father and everything, really, I did, there's a, the, the part of the movie I did I I lost. I cried. Sure. I cried like a baby. I didn't. I don't sure. care what anybody says. But overall, 
I thought that it was because some dumbass I know was like, oh, it's just going to be a, a Stranger Things based off a of one preview. And I thought, I thought it was well, I thought it was well done. I mean, it was, was it, you know, was it like, it's kind of like, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I liked it, and I didn't want to like it because I, I hate the, uh, the nostalgia grab. Like They're talking about making, remaking Quantum Leap, for Christ's sake, which is a show that ended in a logical way. But anyway, Perry, what did you, what did you think of Ghostbusters? I haven't seen it. I, ah! I didn't go see Ghostbusters <laughs> for, in large part because I uh, I don't have any faith anymore in Jason Reitman, <laughs> I had, uh, who was a director whose first three films are really interesting – Two of them are really good, and then uh, just completely lost the thread and uh, fooled me. I think as a director, I I thought he oh. liked people, and I don't think he oh. likes people anymore. Oh. And I don't think he's very interesting in now pretending that he might figure out a way to pretend to show that he kind of likes people. And so I really had little interest uh, in it. It felt like, yeah, it felt like it's time for the young Reitman to write the ship, and he's gonna ride dad's coattails to do that and then it was and then all the reviews made me think yeah i can wait <laughs> as much as i like paul rudd i, I like paul rudd a lot up oh, boy i don't need to see finn wolfhard in anything ever <laughs> was, i don't is, is that the name of the the, the boy character from i don't stranger know who... things no the older kid that's the kid from stranger okay. things finn wolfhard who as a little kid <laughs> looked like maria medeiros in pulp fiction it took me forever to watch that first season of Stranger Things to figure out who he looked like, and oh that was God. it. <laughs> well, that's yeah. – Oh, man, I was going to get that in my head. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> well, that's like I, I mentioned to you. You know, I was watching The Power of the Dog, and the, and the, the kid in that, like, immediately reminded oh, me of the so – good. He yeah. reminded me of uh, of Andrew Dismukes from Saturday Night Live. Yes. I was like, hey, look at Dismukes over there. I can um, see where you got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and, and you know, it, it's funny. Just to, to touch on Rogelio, you know, you, I, I remember – the first movie I remember, I remember crying a ton at it, it. It ended up not really having anything to do with the movie. I don't think it was uh, my great grandmother had died in like 1991 or 92. She was 91 years old. I didn't know her that well, but I knew her enough. And when she died, I wasn't like at the funeral. I wasn't crying. My parents were crying. My brother was crying. He's six years older than me. And I was just kind of like, I don't know. And then like a couple years later or six months later, I was watching that army movie with Charlie Sheen, not platoon. It's the one, it's it's got his dad in it, and and Charlie Sheen is in a cadence. Yeah, he's 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 in prison with like six black dudes, uh, and that's kind of I, I don't know I don't really know what the purpose of the movie is, but uh, I remember seeing it and watching it and liking the characters, and one of the characters gets killed, and it broke me. I started crying for like fifteen minutes, and then I finally at the end of it, I realized I was crying for my dead grandmother, or yeah. great grandmother. Um, and sometimes it can do that, man. Like uh, I don't know. I mean, the, that's the, the female, power of female, film, even not necessarily great film. No, and that's and that, the female lead, the mother character. I was kind of eh about. She was I mean, towards the end, you know, a little bit. But honestly, it was the the younger the uh, his granddaughter, uh, Egon Spangler's granddaughter. I thought did a really good job. And mm -hmm. the guy that put the kid's name that was podcast, which was kind of oh, like yeah. secondary. Hey, what's uh you know what's just going a secondary yeah. character in there. It's it's definitely for anybody Ghostbusters fans. They're, they're gonna argue. They, it, it was it was a way to please the fans who were like, "We can have a female Ghostbusters movie." <laughs> and, you I could liked, definitely tell was that. For the record, I liked that. I liked that movie too. I, was, I thought it was funny. fine. Yeah, it was fine. I, I didn't... And all these like the angry video game nerds like, "I'm not gonna watch it." You know what? I don't care. Congratulations. Right. I don't care. Yeah. You have millions of fans, and blah blah blah. Your your rumor childhood bullshit. Pardon my language. Well, sorry. I, I just, but no, you. I have no tolerance for it. I don't. But yeah, well then, then when you're a movie studio and you go, hey, there are a bunch of angry guys who want to see a movie. If we make it, let's do it. <laughs> well, However, I will say cool. this: I stop. By, I mean, I'm a huge Transformers fan. There's a bunch of Transformers on my shelf right here. For, yes, I, mean, I just got. I mean, I just got one recently. Baseball Transformers. <laughs> that's my thing. Okay. When the Michael Bay, I saw the first movie. I was after that. Nah, no, I'm good. But but I because in my mind I had what I had in my mind. Then they came out mm -hmm. with Bumblebee, and my yeah, buddy people Dave's like Bumblebee, like, right? I never did see it. Bumblebee, I just, Dave, my buddy Dave was like, "Go see Bumblebee." I'm like, "No, it's a Transformers movie." He's like, "No, trust me." I'm like, "Okay." And the first scene is exactly from Generation One, like the cartoon. I'm like, "All right, I'm in." And it was, it was a really <laughs> good movie. But so I kind of I'm kind of hypocritical about it, but at the same time, the the the, the amount of anger people got about Ghostbusters, the female cast. 
was ridiculous. Yes, yes, it was. Was that as good as the original Transformers cartoon movie with You Got to Touch in it? <laughs> you got to touch. You it got the power. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can. Hey, oh, what, go ahead, Rush. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to use a, as a segue into the Paul Thomas Anderson movie, Liquor's yeah, Pizza. Paul, <laughs> Paul Thomas Anderson did uh, Boogie Nights, of course, one of the great movies uh, of my lifetime. Uh, of our lifetime, man. and yeah, yeah, and you know, I'm not like I'm not. I haven't seen all of his movies. I've seen. Uh, there will be blood. I've seen Boogie Nights. We watched Magnolia, of course, uh, to to talk about it on on Bad Hop Radio. I think I I'm willing to bet probably the last two were like the two you missed, right? You probably haven't seen Inherent Vice. I haven't seen or I haven't seen Phantom Thread, Phantom Thread. Inherent Vice, or or The Master. I haven't oh, seen okay. the last three. Then I guess. Um, okay. But I went to see this, and uh, I, I, I explained it to you where I was. I'm kind of pretty simple when I go to a movie. I, I I'm while I'm watching it, I'm trying to figure out where it's going and what the point of it is. And like more than an hour into that movie, I'm like, I, I don't know where this is going. I, I'm not, I don't know how I feel about this. Uh-huh. And, and eventually what happened was I just uh, kind of clung on to the characters. I liked the, the two main characters enough to care that yep. they were hanging out. And I want I think I told you at the end of the movie, I was like, that's fine. I, I, I enjoyed this. I would like to see those characters more. And that was it. That was like my end takeaway. And I think what you said about it, it I think is probably... The correct <laughs> view. No, of it. no, no, don't, well, no. I don't want to say I, correct. Don't, don't do that. Don't. I, well, I, I understand what you meant, and I guess you could explain now, yeah, so people know what I mean. Yeah, and I, I love Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, and they, yeah. I, you know, he's, you know, there are for me when a director reaches a particular level, I'm going to see everything they do. I care about what they do, even if it's not good. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be worth taking in. And Licorice Pizza to me was the first Paul Thomas Anderson film that felt like, wow, okay, he's just entertaining himself. And that's, and I don't, that sounds insulting. That sounds like I don't want a director to do that. I do. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I'm, what I'm stunned by with Licorice Pizza is the incredible response uh, from critics to it. I'm, I'm stunned it's getting these glowing reviews. I'm like, this is fine, but it's really slight. And really minor and i didn't find it that incredibly charming it's charming i liked it mm-hmm. i like like you said it's 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 fine to hang out with both of them but there are long sequences in that movie that are like i don't care about and the ones that are really showy he already kind of did that all technically in boogie nights so it's like he's really it felt like just sort of returning to safe ground to do something really familiar and there's good stuff in it again i sound i don't like the film it's a really difficult film for me to talk about for this reason uh but it's it's fine if it wins him the oscar you know with 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 all apologies to our guest that just left no the departed is fantastic scorsese and, <laughs> and, and i'm glad he got the oscar for it i'm not saying it's his best but if paul thomas anderson gets an oscar for licorice pizza i'll be like huh Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he has one. Don't get me wrong, but okay. Yeah, yeah I didn't. I, I guess I hadn't thought about that. That yeah, he doesn't have an Oscar. But you, no, what you said about calling it kind of small, it, it made sense to me. In, in that, it's it's there aren't a whole lot of universal themes there that I could pull out of it. There's not, I don't think a young guy falling for an older woman is necessarily a, a universal theme. There've been some good movies about it. Uh, I've never seen Harold and Maude, but I know people love it. Uh, one of my reactions to this was, I, I thought it was like Rushmore, but with like heart, like there was this young guy who was just scheming and, and uh, you know, I, and I like, I like some of those old, uh, yeah, what's his name movies, you know, uh, Rushmore and, and, uh, oh, Wes Anderson. I like some. I, I haven't really followed his career that much. They all seem kind of samey to me. Um, but uh, what I what I love about it is what what I love best about Licorice Pizza is it's and we get at this with um. There's another movie that I know you like that we've talked about, Drinking Buddies. That, that I don't hits, know. If, I don't. Do we it, have, I, do we have I don't know if that's. I don't think I've seen that unless I oh! was drinking with a buddy when I watched it. And, yes. I don't remember. It. I like licorice pizza because it gets at a relationship that I, I think is pretty common that isn't done in movies, which is a genuine friendship between a man and a woman where there is sexual tension, and yet mm-hmm. they both understand that nothing's going to happen. 
And that's really great. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not a place you go to really often. And it's the one thing that sort of, for all the people who have gotten in a tizzy about the fact that this is supposedly a romance between a 15 year old boy and a 25 year old girl, they're like, well, you haven't seen the film then. Cause that's not what this is. The, those yeah. feelings are there and they're even acknowledged, mm -hmm. but they both know nothing is going to happen. And that's a really interesting line to walk. And I almost, I would rather have more of that than have that like, 10 minute you know uh a tangent with sean penn in the movie where I'm like, I didn't... this is a waste i understand i understand what you are doing and why you want to do this but it's not as interesting as everything else you put on in the movie <laughs> i didn't understand that really i was like what why are we doing this like i guess you know like you see the various incarnations of what she wants to do and how who she wants to be and stuff and i, I thought it was interesting i thought she she got more to do than oh, yeah. Cooper Hoffman did. Oh, yeah. um, and I thought he was fine too, but he never seemed to like, he was always just the same kind of confident kid who was going to get, get his way one way or another. Uh, and she just kind of was lost and looking for stuff. But yeah, I didn't understand the whole point of that. I was like, why, why is this happening? Is this just to get uh, Sean Penn and Tom Waits to hang out with for a couple days? <laughs> <laughs> only in part. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you could explain it to me, but... Hey, Chris was gone. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to grow up. Um, <laughs> No, and, and welcome to button. Tom Waits Radio. <laughs> but to your point, Perry, and I, I think I touched there's on it. Yeah, there's all deep to the left. <laughs> oh, there's a whole. On. I listen to that all day long. Tom yeah. Waits calling a volume would be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. That would shock me if he like secretly loves baseball too. Um, <laughs> no, there's a scene where where uh, Cooper Hoffman's character really wants to touch. Uh, yeah, uh, I forgot Alana right. Hames uh, wants wants to touch her boobs, and and like he almost does, but then he realizes he can't. He's he's not. Yeah, he's not allowed to. It's not, and that's to your point. That yeah, it's it's there's the affection there, but they both know they can't do anything about it. And uh, but I don't know. We don't want to spoil the movie for anybody who's seen to. it. Not that they yeah. can't. They're not yeah. going to. It's not like it. It's not some forbidden fruit that's some putting some distance between them. It's just an element of their relationship and that's great yeah and and you know i did some like you know cursory looking at, at oscar buzz and stuff like that and it sounds like there, there'll be some nominations for licorice pizza but it's probably not gonna you know it's not gonna be the big winner this year i don't know i, you... I wouldn't think so but mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised if you know nah i, I can't see it winning anything yeah. <laughs> I can see it there like, hard time seeing it winning anything. I could see, you know, like it's 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 a realistic depiction of the early seventies, right? There could be some like art direction or uh oh, costumes. Yeah. yeah. But none of the big awards. It'll get a lot of nominations. Yeah. At least five, I bet. It, it, it would think screenplay. I would think probably best picture. Mm -hmm. I, I can't I can't see that seems reasonable. They have very few, you know, really big out, outside of West Side Story and Macbeth, they don't have these real prestige projects this year by, you know, well-known A-list yeah. Oscar-winning filmmakers. So I think he's going to be attractive that way. Uh, so I, I, it'll, it'll get some run. It'll get some play. And it's doing really well with year-end award, with year-end critic stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'll know in February 8th when the nominations come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't realize when they were coming out. Yeah, but it's nice to always talk to you beforehand and then a little bit afterward. I, I you know, one of the things I enjoyed – this past uh, several months was just getting back to the movie theater. It, oh, yeah. Like, uh, and I went and saw – I didn't see everything. I saw a bunch of stuff, I, it, a bunch of bad stuff, a bunch of decent stuff, some good stuff. I saw – I think I I went and saw all the Marvel movies I could just to – you know, because I could. Sure. And, and, and Black Widow was a weird movie. It's like James Bond. It's totally uh, inconsequential. You don't ever need to see it. Uh but whatever. Um, and then I saw the Eternals, which is weird and nobody liked, but it was like, I kind of enjoyed it, but it didn't stick with me at all. And then I saw the Spider-Man, but then I also went, we went with Harrison and saw Ghostbusters, okay. which uh, he seemed to enjoy. We saw Clifford, which was much better than I expected. It wasn't like <laughs> very low bar there. Yeah. I'm well, sure you know, I, 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 low bar. you know, I, I go into these kids movies generally expecting a Marmaduke and, Woo! uh, and, you know, it wasn't, it was not, uh, you know, Paddington or anything like that. I wouldn't even compare it, uh, you know, as to like the Peter Rabbit movies, but it was, it was a decent movie. And, and Harrison during the movie cried like All a right. baby and he's in his, you know, he's seven or eight and, and he was just really sad uh, at a scene. I'm like, wow, this, so this is working. It's, it's doing what it's supposed to do here. I don't know if they're 
goal is to make seven year olds cry, but if it does, I think the message is hitting home. Movies are empathy machines, man. That's yeah. what they do. And that yeah. they, if he's grasped that at seven or eight, fantastic. Yeah, and then so I, I you know, every now and then, every like once a decade, I get into Oscar mode. I'm like, I want to go see all these Oscar movies. So I went and saw Licorice Pizza, and then I went and saw um, Nightmare Alley, which I knew oh, very little yeah. about. Um, and I thought it was, you know, it was good. It was, uh, you know, Bradley Cooper. I thought was really good. And the acting was great. It was, it looked good. Fantastic. It's an it looks interesting fantastic. story. Yeah, yeah. Well, you it's know, a I mean, great looking movie. I don't, I don't have, you know, I don't have a ton to to base things on. What what yeah, I didn't see. Great looking movie. What I didn't see was uh, West Side Story because no one saw it. Um, I did. Uh, yeah, and I also didn't see uh, what is it? Tick Tick Boom. I saw Tick Tick Boom. Yes. And those are those are those both musicals. They are. And Western, yeah. They and, are, and, uh, and they're both adaptations of stage musicals. Uh, I generally stay are, away. And they're both good. Yeah. I will tell you, Tick Tick Boom is outstanding. I really like Tick Tick Boom a bunch, and that's sitting there on Netflix, so anybody can check that out right now. Yeah, uh, I'll, that's I'll try. Got, that's got pretty much my favorite performance of the year. Andrew Garfield in that is just, you know, I, I hate to use something as lazy as force of nature, but it came to mind while I was watching it. He's really good. He's really impressive. He's not someone you knew could sing. And not only does he sing really well, he, he moves really well. I'm sure I would wish I could have seen his angels in America on stage. Oh, yeah. I would love to have seen him on stage in that. I mean, it's, he's a really good actor. Has he who, been nominated before? Like Social Network, maybe, uh, or at least too minor in that. Maybe supporting. No, it would have been supporting if he got yeah. nominated for that, and I don't yeah. know that he did. That's an interesting question. I would have to research. What was? Uh, I can't think of anything. He's not going to get nominated this year for Eyes of Tammy Faye, although he's very good at it. I oh, that's it's, another one I saw, which I enjoyed. I mean, it's you know. Yes, it's it's good. I, I I don't think it's great. I think I think she's outstanding, and that's. I know that's a big thing for you because you. Yeah, I don't. I don't like her. <laughs> did you see actress. did you see that raj see what the eyes of tammy faye no i want to what? is it any good yeah it's good uh, yeah it's, it's worth watching so i'm always been intrigued by that uh entire subculture of uh people trying to steal your money then but, by all means <laughs> check it out yeah, most of <laughs> most of my knowledge of events in the 80s was filtered through Saturday Night Live and Saturday Night Live reruns. <laughs> yeah. So that's all I really knew of Tammy Faye Baker. And I remember, you know, these, you know, stealing all sorts of money and all this stuff. So, and I don't know, it's a biopic about her. I don't know how true to life it is, but I was really kind of, I found her a, a more compelling figure than I expected, uh, particularly what appeared to be an early embrace of the, the gay and lesbian community. And, and I had no idea about that. So that so was kind of cool to see. What's interesting about her too is that she tried her hardest to get the to keep the marriage on the straight and narrow. But Jimmy was it just Jim Baker? Jim Baker's, Jim Baker. a, yeah, Jim Jim Baker's Baker. a piece of work. And so I and she was on the surreal life, I think it was. She was on some sort yeah. of reality TV before she and when she had cancer, she still went on TV and she she really gutted it out. And like I had a lot of respect for her for going out there and just trying to convey the message that, you know, just be acceptable of everybody. And so but yeah, when she was on, I think it was the Surreal Life with, I think Gary Coleman was on the cast. I can't remember. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. That, it, it was so, it was just cast of characters of people that you would never think in, in the real world would meet. But Tammy Baker came across real, uh, really, really likable. And I need to see them. Real quick question before I forget, though. How did Alana Ham, who is in the, or Haim, is it Haim? It's Haim, sorry. The band Haim. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him or not. She was oh, in yeah. the pizza. Uh, how was her performance? That's what I wanted to ask. I thought she was excellent. I, I you know, I, I for I think it was like her first film role. And the first film role, first role ma- really. like, I mean, it's she's kind of a quirky character, but she, I, I don't know, I, I, I was, uh, I thought she was really good. <laughs> I don't know. How this know is. Paul, and, Paul, Thomas Anderson has directed like a half dozen of their videos. Yeah, so they are they are friends. Like you mm. know, they 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 go they've known each other for years. And you know they are from the valley. They are, this this is this is his stomping grounds. This is what he knows and what he films. And so I'm sure he's comfortable having her there. And yeah, and I will say this: I, I don't know that she's an actress. She's really good here, and she has uh, at least one outstanding line reading. There's one there's one moment of line delivery, and I bet you know exactly what I'm thinking of, Chris, if you've seen the movie, where she gets a huge laugh. <laughs> deservedly so and it's I, not it's not an edit so you know it's all her 
It's not, you know, it wasn't cut to get the laugh. She just delivers this, uh, this line of exasperation right on cue. It's really well done. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I would expect to see her in more movies, but I don't know. I don't know if that's what she wants to do. Yeah, exactly. If she's interested, it's there. Yeah. People and hire I've, her from this. How's yeah. that for an answer? I would, I would think so. And, and I thought that, like I said, I thought Cooper Hoffman was was good too. I, I, I like, you know, his dad was amazing. It's going to be. T- um, it, yeah, you know, I feel bad for him and Gandolfini's kid. You know, yeah. from, that was which I never, I didn't even watch that. Uh, the Many Saints oh, of so Newark. I, I, I liked Many Saints of Newark. It's it's mm-hmm. not perfect by any means, but he was actually really good. Interesting. Uh, Gandolfini's son. That's. Uh, that story and the story with the with the mom is my favorite stuff in that movie actually they do a really great job of that's that's an interesting case of something that feels like what feels like is going to be fan service in that movie is actually Mm -hmm. the best stuff in the movie and not because it's fan service he's actually figured out a way to show this relationship and let us see how it always was and you can see at the same time where it started from so that where it curdled by the time we know Tony is an adult later in the so It's good. It's really good. That stuff's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I, it'd be interesting. You know, I didn't, we didn't finally watch, I, I watched the Soprano some when it first came out, but Tara and I finally watched it like two, three years ago. We streamed through, you know, bench through it and that was fun. I, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I'll watch it when it's real. I don't know. Exactly. It might, yeah. yeah. It's time Listen. to I, I've been wanting to watch it too, but my, my wife for a reason doesn't want to watch. It's like, I've had enough Italian mobster stuff. I'm like, Okay, considering that anytime anything like that, but then we just we we went through the whole psych. We just watched all of psych recently. Psych, yeah. <laughs> so right now we're on. Um, who by the way, I, there's a, uh, speaking of the movie too. Skyler, um, been watching the fabulous uh, gemstones. Right? Oh, the righteous oh, okay. gemstones. That's I haven't. New I, season has been <laughs> phenomenal. I have never like there are all those shows on HBO. I never watched, despite us being a baseball show. I never watched Eastbound and Down. I never watched Vice Principals, and I never watched Righteous Gemstones, and I always meant to, kind of. I just haven't. Do yourself a favor. Before the minor league season starts, Chris, watch, yeah, I need to watch. watch Eastbound and Down. And I should probably watch the one about baseball, at least. Yeah, that, um, yeah, the first season's good. The second season, eh, it's, it's okay. If you only watch one of those three, yes, I would tell you to watch Eastbound and Down, and I, yes, the first season, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Perry, if you have uh, seen or are interested in, in watching Station Eleven. Oh, I haven't yet. What is? I know what this is. I'm blanking. It, it's um, it's it's an HBO Max series. Right. It's it's ten episodes long. It stars the the woman from Catch or Halt and Catch Fire. It's based on a novel from 2014. It's it's kind of uh, it's it's basically a post apocalyptic uh show, but like surprisingly uplifting and. Okay. Like I, I enjoyed so, it. So the leftovers, but happy. Well, so yeah, I mean, I, I never did watch the leftovers. Uh, and so, I. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people really love that show, mm-hmm. and and uh, I think the guy who created this show wrote uh, for the leftovers or was okay. a producer. Um, but yeah, the, the thrust of it is that uh, there's a a horrible flu pandemic that kills, but it kills like everybody, like 999 out of a thousand people. Um, and there are small pockets of civilization left and you see kind of this, this group of interesting characters right before that happens. And then 20 years later and how, uh, the world okay. has changed, but, That's but it, it, what it is, is it follows this group of actors and musicians who go around Lake Michigan performing Shakespeare, um, <laughs> And it's got it's got Lori Petty in it. It's got um, well, that's, not, Petty. that's not a good thing for me. Well, she's all right in it, but uh, <laughs> well, you don't like Tank Girl, anything. Perry? I see. I hate Tank Girl. She's the um, only a League of Their Own would be a great film if she weren't in it. She's <laughs> such a weak link in that. Movie. You know what? Um, what was the movie with her and Andy Dick and um, Holly Shore? Is it in the Army? In oh, the I Army know. now. I would believe that. that. Yeah, yeah, she was in that piece of crap. <laughs> uh, let me see. I'm trying to see. Is it Himesh Patel? Oh, she was is that in Point Break too. That's right, Point Break. I'm sorry, about Chris. <laughs> yes, she was. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed that that show, Station Eleven. I actually heard about it from Kevin Goldstein's podcast guest, his previous show, Jeff Passan, who's the national writer for yes. ESPN. Um, 
I should yeah. check this. I should check this out. It's going to take me a little bit, Chris, because I will tell you that uh, my wife and I have one episode left in Squid Game. So oh, I've had, okay. I've had enough of uh, just foreboding well, terror and death for just a, a little while. I need a couple of weeks before I'll get yeah, into well, that. But I, it, I, you've intrigued me. That's what. That's what I. Uh... Like I said, I, I it, it for a post-apocalyptic show, it was remarkably nice and okay. heartfelt. And and I the finale, I cried like a baby. Wow! Uh, in a way that I haven't cried since I read The Color Purple. Um, wow! All which right. was in like 1999. Uh, and you know who knows? Maybe I, I need to re-up on my meds or something like that. But it, I just I got really sucked in and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if, if you it works in a lot of Shakespeare and it works in it works in some cool pop cultural hip hop rock and roll things too and I, I I don't know I enjoyed it I no that's one of the, a great endorsement I will check that out I my, Dan and I are gonna look for something to watch after we finish this we I can maybe I can talk her into that yeah, you'll see you know who knows maybe maybe you'll go no not for me but um I don't know I, I enjoyed it so uh, yeah I, I don't. Uh, I don't know what else. Uh, no, we, we we touched on you know you you liked uh, you loved Don't Look Up. You loved uh, Andrew Garfield's Love performance. Would you say Garfield was the best uh, acting Love, performance you saw? It is. I love Tick Tick Boom. I I, I think the movie's outstanding. I, that's Lin Manuel Miranda did a fantastic job with his first job as a director. Uh, it's a it's really great. I think it's really great, even if you aren't a musical person. Mm -hmm. I really do. I mean, it's a musical, but it it is such a great character study of this creative monster and i mean that just because they feel the need to create not that they are horrific yeah. not that they're a horrific person <laughs> but so, so many so many stories that are about a young artist are about you know uh there, there is there is some nobility in like sacrificing everything else in order to succeed and this absolutely addresses that and is very truthful about that and yet doesn't make it noble it's you know it is genuinely a sacrifice it is what, you know, I, and it's not like some choice he makes. He just does it. And he understands what he's never going to have because he feels the need to do this other thing. And that's great. And having having an artist whose story, you know, who created that story autobiographically in Larson to have another artist tell that story for them because they're dead is really is, is kind of beautiful. And I, I really like the film a lot. And, and All I right. Know, uh... On that note. Oh, all right. Well, I was just going to touch on a couple other things. Sorry, right? Uh, just well, the only other like big movie names I've seen, and, and I mentioned it to you, uh, Belfast apparently, which I called Dublin because <laughs> I'm not paying enough attention, and uh, and Coda, and I don't know what any of those things are out. I don't know if you've seen them. You said I haven't seen Coda. I've heard also good things about it. Belfast is going to be up for everything. Everyone's decided this is the prestige film that we've decided is important and good. And mm -hmm. I, I have a huge soft spot for Kenneth Branagh, especially as an actor, but also as a director. Mm -hmm. Not that everything's good. Not that everything's perfect. Um, but I have a soft spot for him. I like him. And uh, this is like Licorice Pizza, really small, really, and very personal. And um, I don't know that he, that, that he really – steps out to try to bring anybody into the film mm -hmm. it feels really insular to me I, it doesn't have the emotional wallop that it sort of is making you think that it's supposed to have and that's weird <laughs> um but it's yeah. good i mean i don't i'm not I, again i don't want to run it down it's just it's the one it's the one thing i guess i could call a disappointment only because i feel like the calling this a giant blockbuster best picture thing is not doing it any help Oh, you're gonna gotcha. be you're gonna be underwhelmed by that approach to it. Well, yeah. It, I, one of the things I like about you know when you when you start discussing uh, like Oscar winners, it, it's for me it's a little bit like talking about like Cy Young winners or MVP, and you like you got to come up with these different criteria. Like, eh, yeah. but Zach Wheeler threw 50 more innings, and uh, you know this sort of appeals to a broader base. And look at like, everybody likes Argo, right? Um, <laughs> See, and so. I was thinking, I was thinking about trying to come up with a new allegory for us for this episode because we haven't talked in a while. And I was thinking, wow, so where music and where movies and baseball are, so basically now the major leagues, uh, you know, what with you know, getting it to the point where we've made baseball kind of boring to watch with the three true outcomes is basically what Disney's done with Marvel movies. Like they've perfected the algorithm for what is the best and successful. And, yeah. and it's left it it's left everything else sort of barren. And it's like, 
no, we, we, we can do better. We can, we can do better. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, I know go ahead, Rush. That, was just that was one of the things that I was, I realized like talking to my wife was, is that we, we went back and watched movies that we've not seen. Like I like, I just watched as good as it gets for the first time ever uh, a couple nights ago. And so there's movies that go back and, because I, I'm not really, to be honest with you, there's not really much interest out there. The, 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 the Coward Counter was because I, I love Oscar Isaac and I think that he's a really good actor. Even Moon Knight, which is a, actually a comic I did read, I'm, I'll be interested in seeing, but I, it's few and far between. Like, I in going back and watching movies that are even like, uh, I'll give it another example of like, um, like, uh, my wife had never watched The Ventures of Buckeye Bonzu in, in like those kind of like obscure yeah. 80s movies that were made just to be made are not going to happen anymore and so those are few and far between and even um the other oscar uh the one with matt damon him and the they play neighbors or um oscar is a salesman he finds he ends up getting killed uh, oscar isaac is a salesman yeah what's that movie where oh, the clooney movie yeah the clooney movie yeah uh so, oh i'm blanking the name of it it's like suburbia or something yeah suburbia like that. and by the way troy on YouTube with the comment real quick. I think it's the second best odds to win in the central court in the Vegas. I can firmly believe that. that. I, I, that's I, interesting. I would probably, I don't know. I'd still probably go with the twins over the tigers, but I could see, you know, you know, Vegas does things because they want people to bet and they're probably tapping in the tigers fans being super optimistic, right? Like <laughs> that's how it works in Vegas. Right. I mean, yep. they want people to, to place money. So Although, wait, they would probably be, I don't know, whatever. If that were the case, they would probably put lower odds of the Tigers. Ah, That's why I don't gamble. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 as you know, Perry and Rogelio, I could talk with you guys all night. Uh, yeah. But the listeners might not want to do that. We could we could still keep talking after the show's over yeah. if we want. Oh, unless, you have, sure. unless you have to clear out. Uh, so. On, on that note, though, I mean, yeah, we'll wrap it up. Um, I was just going to say, this has to be this, it has to end of the show this way. Yes! What I liked about the YouTube video, too, is they describe it as a, as a real thing. Studio City 1983 laying down what will eventually be the greatest theme song of any cartoon ever. <laughs> So, but that's, yeah. <laughs> and then John C. Riley dies in the studio, like so good, oh, oh, so good. So I love the story. It's it's Michael Penn who plays the producer of that recording session. Yeah, oh, uh, is it? no myth. Yes. Michael Penn's no myth. Who's yes. now he married to you, Amy Mann? Yes, for a long time. Yeah. Great couple. Uh, yeah. And Michael is a very um, he doesn't give a lot. He's he's a really like stone faced guy. And so they, they they talked about the set. John C. Riley's only goal was to torture him. And so all of that stuff of him leaving around the control is just to annoy Michael Penn to the point that he reacts to something. It was really funny. Yeah, the, the, every, uh, I saw Michael Penn when he when uh, the last skit that um, on SNL that uh, what's his face did uh, uh, Portlandia. Um, Fred, oh, Fred Armistead. Armistead. Armistead did. And Michael Penn and his wife came on there and they did like a set on there. And Bill Hader was playing drums and he was crying. And I know he's playing bass or something. I think I can't remember. Anyway, either way, that's a bloop. Another bloop. <laughs> done a lot of bloops tonight. So, no. Yeah. That, that reminded me of the, the, um, what Perry talked about, it reminded me of the Hank Azaria. Hank Azaria was doing an interview talking about, uh, uh, doing heat. And our buddy yeah. Pat, uh, you know, loves Michael Mann, and he was talking about how Michael Mann does so many takes that Al Pacino's reading of, because she got a great ass, uh, <laughs> kept getting more and more over the top, he thinks, because he was just super frustrated with having to keep doing it. And you, and there's a point where Azaria says, Jesus! And he said that was ad lib, like that was him actually reacting to Al Pacino, and that's the cut that made the film. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Great ass! All right, on that note... Great ass! <laughs> We're Sorry. back next week. Next week we have yes. we have Jeff Pontus from Baseball America, and we also have Joe Drake from Prospects Live. So more prospect talk on it. Perry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you as always. Awesome. It's good to see, finally physically see you for the first time. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks again to Kevin Goldstein of Fangrass. That was some good stuff. And 
uh yeah almost two in, yeah, well, yeah including the international talk we had earlier two plus hours I'm gonna, of I'm gonna get uh, perry and, and kg in a room and have them talk about uh scorsese films and the beatles yeah you know what i'll do though yeah. I'll, you know i'll leave a bottle of water in there and go go and then just stay in there, <laughs> you guys gotta fight out exactly because you guys are gonna talk so much you're like who's gonna get the bottle of water first who's gonna open it <laughs> you know and, and go for that so on that note we'll see you next week everybody have a good week as soon as i figure out how to end this damn broadcast <laughs> <laughs>